Perfect. So today on the show, everybody already knows you, Zach, but we got Zach Couples. Uh, we did a podcast before COVID. It was like February or January or something before COVID when I first started up the podcast, at least the first version of this podcast uh, back in the day. And I took your uh, human matrix way back when, your first one ever, right? We're calling it human matrix, correct? I can change that. But okay. I always yes, wanted to call it. Well, technically, it's human matrix. <laughs> I always want to call it movement matrix for some reason. I don't know, uh, but that's alliteration. A, yeah, it, that's what it is. That's what it is. But uh, I took your first human matrix. That's, you know, I owe a lot to you, to be honest, just because yeah, I'd taken some PRI courses and you really helped me kind of connect the dots. Even though that was your first ever course, it helped me in so many ways, like try to bridge the gap to some training and it was great. So I definitely owe a lot. I wouldn't be where I'm at right now without you and your course. So, uh, you know, this, thank you so much for that. But that said, uh, before, you know, enough gushy stuff, uh, Zach, how about you hit us with the, uh, the elevator pitch and let's, let's get rolling. Uh, yeah, sure. So, well, first off, um, I'm flattered. I'm honored to have guided, uh, you even just a little bit and you're an amazing, uh, amazing person, hard worker. So kudos to you, my friend. Uh, my name is Zach couples. I am a physical therapist, uh, strength coach, educator, um, I wear two hats. I work at uh, zackcouples.com on the internet. So I do a lot of uh, remote consultations, online training, and I have a, a staff that also does that underneath me as well, where I basically um, work with people on improving a wide variety of issues. And then I teach other people, coaches, clinicians, how to do the same thing. The way I do that is either with mentoring or my seminar, Human Matrix, um, which basically like the the problem was how do we take all of the complexities of movement and all the different systems and boil them down to the simple commonalities and create a way that we can impact a wide variety of people, both on the low intensity rehab side of things and the high intensity performance things and create a consistent approach where we can utilize the same concepts in both of those areas to help our clients reach whatever their goals are, whether it's getting out of pain or performing at a high level. Um, and that takes up a bulk of my time. And then I do see patients out in uh, wonderful Las Vegas, Nevada, where I'm at. I'm at Elevate Sports Performance and Healthcare. And that's pretty much what I do. Perfect. I remember you were in Lexington when we did our first podcast and now you've moved out there seems like you're in a much better place now uh, a place that's a lot more fitting for you uh, so that's good to see is it because i'm a degenerate <laughs> a degenerate no i think most uh well, we could talk about lexington degenerates but <laughs> that's a whole nother uh conversation so we'll keep it at that um but that said you know i see you like you're hiking you're doing all that stuff that facility is super nice so like what's the population look like there is it kind of everything or sports what is it yeah um elevate's great it, we have um we have a lot of golfers that that's a big population i would say like we have golfers and then we have just general population uh people who have some sort of physical impairment of any kind whether it's you know they want to hike for longer periods of time or they have pain and we basically help them restore their physical freedom. So whatever it is that they want to get back. And it was cool about our system is we have everything in house. So it's a one-stop shop where you can work with our trainers. Um, if you got any medical stuff, we have physical therapists, chiropractors on staff. We have massage therapists to help with recovery therapists, I should say. And then we have nutrition coach on staff as well. So it's like, what we really wanted to do is create an all encompassing um, way to help people because you know, a lot of times you can get far with one thing, but if you have a whole team helping guide you to your goals, you can just get that much greater of an improvement. So um, we've been doing some cool stuff. We've had some really cool uh, cases that have passed through. Nice. Yeah, that's kind of how the place we were talking before, um, sports physical therapy back in Seattle. Shout out to them. Wonderful place. Same thing, just like training, nutrition, massage therapy. We didn't have chiropractics, but, you know, all the TPTs, we were able to, you know, do the cracky and poppy on you if you needed to. So, but no, it was a great spot. But, you know, we could, getting past the uh, the nice stuff, I want to start this off with a bang, 
okay, with a question for you. So as of late, I've seen a lot of YouTube videos and I've had a lot of clients or potential clients come to me asking questions, Q&As, all that stuff. And one of the big things they ask, and you know, they may have tried a couple of exercises and they're not seeing results, they're not getting out of pain, normal YouTube stuff they do. Uh, when I try to help them, one of the first questions I'm getting hit with is they want me to assess visual <laughs> and dental stuff on them right off the bat because they feel like they can't get the changes they need and they have to have this type of stuff. Um, and, you know, I'll educate them a little bit. I'm like, hey, I can get pretty dang far below the neck if I need to. We might just need to adjust some of the exercise. Usually 99% of the time we're able to, but I'm curious in your facility and everything that you're doing, how much you're actually using server cool interventions and if you think that it's something necessary for general population. There's a time and place for it, but I, I work with quite a few people who've gone a lot of places, tried a lot of different things. And even those people, and they, they've, they've seen folks who do similar things to me or practice in a similar way, or they've tried the YouTube route themselves. And without a doubt, I would say 95, probably 97% of those people still do not have mastery of the basics because the assumption is that, okay, I watched the video and I'm hitting the points the way I should, but it's hard for us to evaluate ourselves and how we're doing things, especially if it's not what I'm trained to do. We have our blind spots. And what I do as a physical therapist and a coach is I pick out those blind spots. Um, and with, and more often than not, truly hammering those basics leads to a big impact. And I think most people don't exhaust their conservative measures enough before going that route, because a lot of people think, you know, if I, if I work with, uh, you know, an optometrist in a certain way, and or I get this dental splint that that's going to fix everything. And if you look at the research, maybe not. Um, it, there, there's definitely an influence, I'm, and I'm not denying that. But from the people I've seen who've tried those interventions, um, it's really a crapshoot in terms of what changes. Something can change. It's not always your pain, though. Uh, I think, and even in in that domain, maybe you do need uh, to work with an optometrist. Uh, maybe you do need some sort of dental intervention, but there are also conservative measures down both of those fields that I think a lot of people gloss over. If you want to get special glasses and do exercises with those glasses, but you haven't done any vision training with an optometrist, you're missing the boat. You, you have not exhausted conservative measures, and that will get people far. I have referred quite a few people for that and gotten some big changes for a, a variety of conditions, especially if you've had a history of concussions, like, yeah, you should get that checked. Um, maybe, you know, you think you need a dental splint, but are you able to, do you have full dynamics and motor control of your tongue and your facial muscles? Myofunctional therapy. I've referred people for that and that can make a profound impact. In fact, there was a case study I just put out on uh, Twitter uh, and, uh, uh, you know, all that other stuff that, that you do. Um, I had a woman who complained of headaches. Uh, what else does she have gone? Ear fullness, neck pain, facial pain, all of these things. And so, you know, someone might be thinking, uh oh, we might have a cranial cervical patient or client. We probably got to do some stuff. I had her <laughs> literally just do some oral facial exercises that were really easy. Neck range of motion was damn near full symptoms were significantly reduced. Didn't have to refer to anyone else. Um, so I, even in those fields, there are conservative measures that should be tackled first. And that doesn't mean that you, should, you might not need a more aggressive thing, but the more aggressive things work better if you have a good foundation. On the flip side, one of my, uh, well, she's my boss at Elevate, um, she had a sleep disorder, undiagnosed, 
I recommended she got a sleep study, had severe sleep apnea, ended up having surgery. And that was the right move for her. But it takes looking at all these other things. She had tried PT. She had worked with a functional medicine provider to try to improve her sleep. And, and she was on point with exercise, all of that. Then I was able to comfortably make the referral to someone who could determine whether or not this person was a surgical candidate. Most people don't do that enough. If, if you're not moving on a regular basis, you've not been coached to maximize your joint range of motion, control of your sensory systems. If you aren't doing sleep hygiene stuff, you don't have a good social network, you're not eating mostly whole foods, tackle those first before you start gambling. Because uh, there, uh, you know, with, with that stuff, it can be expensive gambles and it doesn't always pan out. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I guess if you could break this down, then give us the Zach couples hierarchy. Like what? So you kind of said like sleep, nutrition, a couple of those other things. Like how long should someone stick with something like that before they should maybe bring about these questions of like, all right, do I need to go see an optometrist? Do I need to go see a dental specialist? Like, what does that look like? really depends on the person and the symptom presentation, because sometimes you might, you know, if someone presents with a certain cluster of symptoms, you might escalate in one direction much quicker. Just like, you know, if someone has uh, chest pain, you know, chest feels heavy, they're getting pain down their arm, so on and so forth. Well, guess what? We're not going to, you know, exhaust all conservative measures. You got to go to the ER. Ideally, someone who's working with these people has questions in mind that need to be answered that might point you to, oh, this person needs an optometrist or this person needs a psychologist. And so it's about having good screening questions first to determine what is going to um, make someone work with an optometrist. You know, if you've had a history of concussions, if you have uh, some visual disturbance of some sort, maybe you can't team your eyes together, you have double vision, things of that nature, those tripwires might lead you to making that referral to an optometrist. On the dental side of things, if anyone has any type of sleep disturbance, um, that could be snoring. That, some of those are still can be addressed with conservative measures, but snoring, um, they wake up several times in the night to go to the bathroom, they gasp for air, they can't sleep all the way through the night, uh, they wake up early, they wake up not feeling refreshed, or not when I say early, not like, oh, you get up at five, you're probably screwed. Uh, but like they wake up early within their sleep cycles, mm -hmm. um, can't fall asleep. Those would be things where you might have to escalate and get a sleep study to see if there is a dental intervention that's worthwhile. Um, and, and you do that with all systems. And then yeah. that's a matter of troubleshooting which systems need to be addressed for that person. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that you never give anyone exercise and things of that nature, but it's about determining what the biggest bottleneck is to that person reaching their goals and then trying to eliminate that bottleneck. I think that's interesting and a good way to look at it. I mean, it's just exhaust conservative measures, keep money in your pocket at the end of the day. And again, like you said, don't go out and just start gambling right off the bat. You know, it, it's kind of like a bank account. Like you don't want to maybe try to cut down on expenses and save a little bit more money before you hit the casino and just try to <laughs> make it big all at once. But it, it, and even kind of listen to your talk about this. Like, so I, I everyone on this podcast has heard me talk about this a thousand times, but I herniated a disc uh, like L4, L5. It's terrible. Picking up a patient popped. It was terrible. Like right down my leg immediately like sciatica couldn't feel my foot awful drove home yeah so that said what i noticed with some of these things because i was I was hurt man i was looking for anything that i could i met with a couple of like cervical specialists so i was like man like maybe they'll have something to kind of just get me out of pain so that way i can sleep and one of the things i noticed is that you know i've always had good vision i've always had proper you know ocular motor things like skills, everything was able to move properly. But with my herniation, I couldn't adduct my left eye anymore. So I don't know mm -hmm. if that was like a secondary symptom to tension that was happening because of the herniation. And so just it's like, you don't know maybe what this is all coming from potentially. 
I don't know. What are your thoughts on something like that? Yeah. Um, that's interesting. And it was low back and you were getting eye symptoms. Yeah. I don't know. Well, and at the same time, you know, I was starting up my business and I was looking at screens more often. So maybe that was something as well. Yeah. Um, but you know, I can add duct my eye now and I don't have pain symptoms, nothing like that. So, and it's not something I was testing frequently, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 it would appear as though any type of threat within the system could impact a lot of systems. And right. so maybe you had a, a, a link to the visual system, um, you know, with, with uh, a disc issue that could potentially influence things all along the spinal cord and your eyes are an extension of your spinal cord. And so there's, you know, there's changes. Like if you read uh, Shacklock's neurodynamics book, um, which is a great read. Um, he talks about looking at uh, or using eyes within some of your neurodynamic testing as like that last bit uh, change motion within the system. And so it could be that your inability to adduct the eye was a protective strategy to limit the excursion of the um, of the spinal cord yeah. in the case of a, a disc issue. Um, at least that would that would be what I would think. You know, assuming mm -hmm. there wasn't any other stuff that was going on. Obviously. Too, when you're looking at screens for an extended period of time, um, there's issues that happen with convergence or your eyes pointing in and focus. And so maybe there's a fatiguing element with that as well. Um, it's, yeah, there can be a lot of factors. I've even had a buddy who uh, had uh, um, COVID and uh, he had some changes within his vision um, over a short period of time, same thing. And I actually referred him to the optometrist to, to deal with that. To, work on those eye skills. It's all connected. Basically what I'm hearing is go get assessed, <laughs> get assessed by someone before you yeah. start doing crazy stuff. Yeah. And you know, if you can get someone who can plot the attack and help you execute it in a manner that's easy to, to carry out, you know, if you try to like do everything at once, well, you're not going to get anywhere because there's just too many habits to change. But if you can have someone help guide you to maybe the big one to three things you need to focus on, your odds of succeeding are much higher. And if you exhaust all the conservative measures, like across the board, um, even if you do need something that's more aggressive, you're likely to have a better outcome because you have a better foundation ahead of you. It's like why I think, um, you know, doing rehab before you get a surgery is so huge because you're doing everything in your power to get the, the joint in question or whatever it is you're getting done conditioned high enough. You're maximizing the space necessary. So you create a good healing environment and it's easier on the back end because the better shape you go into something, uh, the, you don't fall as far, uh, with the inevitable deconditioning that happens after you have a procedure. It's interesting because you know, I, I, I don't think I ever, like I took that seriously, but I had a, uh, who was it? Strong camps, uh, DJ Marikama on the show. And he was telling me about how he was in a car accident, went through the windshield and like broke his neck, all that stuff. And the only reason he's able to walk to this day is the doctor was like, he, he strength trained, like you had a ton of muscle on you and you were able to like, he played football, did all that stuff. It was everything beforehand that he had done that like saved his life essentially. So it's, it's, it's no joke, especially before surgery. Like you got to do your rehab folks. Like you got to do it um, in terms of, so just kind of like pivoting here. Um, I appreciate you answering that a little bit. Well, you've, you experimented with like cervical type interventions. Like I, you've had your tongue tie released, all those different things. Like, can you, I guess, talk about that before we move on, like just a little bit, if you care to share. Yeah. So I, uh, I've tried a few different things and, um, uh, basically what was, what was going on is it was a little bit of just like curiosity and me search that led to me doing some of the stuff that I've done. Um, because if I did recommend some of this stuff to patients, I wanted to let them know what the process was like. So, um, I've done quite a few things. I've, I've never been someone when, when people test me or do interventions to me, like, I, I don't change that much. I can't get things to stick. Um, and then from just a health standpoint, I've, 
I've had gut issues on and off over the years. And I've, uh, like I would say like two years ago, I started really having some um, difficulty sleeping in terms of just like energy was, was off. And so what I did first way back when was I actually went to the Haruska clinic and I, I did uh, prime program. So I got the glasses, I got a dental splint and, um, I got some nice movement changes. Like I was able to fully squat and I'd never been able to do that before, which was really cool. Um, I, I, I've dealt with like longstanding neck issues over the years. It didn't impact that much, but there's no doubt that my motion was quite a bit better. Um, and that led me to getting my wisdom teeth taken out. I, that helped me because I could move my jaw, but I also wonder if that was a contributing factor, just knowing what I know now about airway to some sleep issues, because the, the thing about wisdom teeth, even if they're not all the way in, is they can help preserve oral volume. And so if I take those away, the bone isn't being stimulated as much because the teeth aren't there. And so the mouth can recess in a bit. And so you have less space to put your tongue. So, you know, it, you really got to make a judgment call on whether or not it's something that you should or should not do. And, and ideally I would get a couple opinions, someone who specializes in airway as well, because they'll, they'll look at that. Most dentists won't look at that because um, there's some liability issues uh, in dentistry. It always comes down to money um, where it's kind of like the thing to do. And if you don't do that and someone comes after you, it's a problem. So I did that. And then I, that's when I started, I, I wouldn't say it was like I got my wisdom teeth out and I started sleeping poorly, but um, right after the pandemic began, I started noticing a lot of afternoon lulls. Um, I was looking into getting some airway stuff done at some point before, um, before the point where I ended up doing some stuff to my teeth, I had gotten a septoplasty, so I deviated septum fixed. That helped my nasal breathing a ton. I used to get colds every winter. It's not a thing anymore. I still would breathe loudly. So then I ended up getting my tongue tie released because I had a limited tongue motion. Now, man, I can catch flies with this bad boy. Um, so I got that taken care of. Um, that was really subtle changes. There was just ways I could move my tongue that I couldn't before, which was which was cool. I don't know essentially essentially what that changed from like a symptom standpoint, but I, it still was a key ingredient because I was pretty restricted. After I'd done those things, that's when I decided to do some um, dental work to see if that would make an impact. I had a Crozat appliance, which is a tooth borne expander, where basically it moves the teeth out in the alveolar bone, so you have more space for your tongue. Um, that seemed to make an improvement in my sleep. To, to a fairly high degree. And then around the same time as I was doing that, I had um, uh, this uh, procedure called the Viver, or Viver, I forget what it's pronounced. And with that, uh, basically what they did was they, they ablate the nasal cartilage. So normally when you breathe in, ideally your nose should get bigger. But if you breathe in and there's a resistance, the nasal passages will collapse in. And so it essentially helps reshape the nose so it stays open more. And so the combination of those things, um, and with me actually like exhausting conservative measures and trying to go to bed at a reasonable time, it helped quite a bit from a sleep standpoint. Uh, nasal breathing is way better since I've had those procedures. Um, I used to get congested when I would hike and I don't really get that anymore. Um, but it's, but it's not perfect by any means. Um, like I still, you know, I lip tape and stuff like that. Sometimes I can feel my tongue fall back depending on what position I sleep in. Um, I still kind of breathe loudly, but it's significantly better than what it was. And um, I, you know, if, if I had done it over again, I probably would not have gone the routes that I did with some of the things, because I think there's just better stuff out now. Like, um, the issue with a lot of the tooth borne appliances, so Crozat, what I had, or the ALF, that's another one that's commonly used, is um, there's risk for erupting the teeth out of the alveolar bone. And I've seen some gnarly cases where they move teeth too far and the roots are showing, the, the, the people are inevitably are going to be losing their teeth. Um, and I've seen that with those appliances. So 
And it also doesn't do as much to change the nasal passages, whereas something like a maxillary skeletal expander, if you can get someone good, does. That's more of a bone-borne appliance where they actually can create changes within the maxilla. Um, a lot of the people claim that some of the tooth-borne expanders can do that, but they don't. It's just not the way that they work. Um, so I probably would have gone that route instead. And, and then with like some of the procedures, I, I got some utility from those. So I probably would have kept them. But um, it, it, it was expensive. I got some improvements for sure. Am I like cured of all my ills? No, but I'm a lot better off than what I was. But at the same time, I work out regularly. I, um, I've done some stuff to essentially rebuild my relationship with food because I had some eating issues like eating disorder, disordered eating and stuff. I've worked with a nutrition coach. I do a lot of the movements that I do. I've actually done vision therapy. So I've done like a lot of other conservative measures alongside that as well. And I could probably do even more on that front. But I think that's probably a reason why these interventions have worked to the extent that they have. You're a busy guy. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and some of it's like, you know, I'm a bit of a perfectionist and like nothing is ever good enough. And I'm a bit of an optimizer as well. And so I was like, well, what if I do this? What if I do that? What if I do that? And I'm just curious. So um, that's also kind of what drives some of this stuff because I, you know, want to live forever. My mom um, passed away uh, when I was young. She was 49. And so that always is kind of in the back of my head as well. Like, uh, am I literally doing all that I can to minimize things that could potentially contribute to an early death? Yeah, no, I understand that. My dad passed away year and a half ago now at 53 hard to hear that Jeez. yeah you know not fun but you know had a heart attack and it's kind of the same mindset in some ways you're like oh like what can i do what what can make this a little bit better how can i stack the deck in my favor <laughs> in comparison yeah. granted yeah. he was a heavy smoker um from like 14 <laughs> he smoked a pack a day so that uh yeah. that'll catch up with you real quick um yeah but yeah no on another note uh trying to pivoting a little bit toward i guess just getting away from the cervical stuff i really appreciate you sharing your experiences with that i think it's extremely valuable to have someone like yourself you know talk about these things and you've done a lot of that you have the experience and you're also saying like hey this conservative stuff is the foundation this is what sets that other stuff up for success or you know they feed into each other it's not like you just get a splint and you're a-okay you're ready to go <laughs> Um, yeah. but that's it. Um, getting into my next question, what would you say is like the, you know, we, we haven't talked in a while. So I want to know, like, what are you getting into? Like, what's the new stuff? How are you upgrading, you know, human matrix and like, what would you say is like been really helpful for your practice and everything you're doing? It kind of is an extension of exhausting conservative measures. It's dialing into fundamentals of coaching. So uh, I, there's a concept that I teach called the stack, um, which is basically like this sequence of things to look at with pretty much all movements. And if you can hit these components consistently with not just like low intensity breathing drills or other things that you and I may do, but also at higher intensity stuff, lifting things of that nature, um, it generally does a lot of good things movement wise. And most people, I, I'm coaching movement professionals they struggle with this stuff. So if you're not a movement pro and you're trying this because myself or Kyle has put out a YouTube video and you think you got it, like you, you might not. Uh, so a lot of it is just really emphasizing that. And even when I kind of think back to myself, like, oh man, that person didn't do well who I worked with or oh, I should have done that. It usually comes down to addressing one of those fundamental pieces of the stack. Um, so, and that's, really what the seminar has become about is it's just really fine tuning, coaching the fundamentals, and then looking at ways to basically get you 75, 80% of the way there. And then I think down the line, but I, I got to see more people. I have to continue to refine the process. I'm working on things where I can get that other 20%. Um, I think one of the holes in my game and I've had, it's, it's just funny. It's like, I've had a string of people recently who I think needed this is, uh, vision and vestibular. So um, my my plan this probably the end of this year, beginning of next year, is to take some classes on some vestibular stuff because I think it's just a 
hole that I'm missing. And uh, I've done vision therapy and I've, I work with uh, Dr. Corrine Landerville in Vegas. She's brilliant. Um, she's taught me some stuff from just like a low level vision stuff that I like just me not knowing that much, but making some improvements there has been quite impactful. So um, that that's where my brain is at right now, learning this stuff, but it's still after I've taught someone all of those fundamental pieces and I've gotten them really good with that. So since you have this on your mind, I'm always, I've asked this to a couple of people. I, I've done a program. It's called um, End Myopia uh, by Jake Steiner. I don't know if you've ever looked into that. No, um, I'm not. He's a interesting guy. Uh, I think he had like minus eight or nine in each of his eyes. So like that's his diopters for the people listening. Like So his contact, like the power that his contacts or his glasses would be at, which is not good. Um, for reference, I've got minus two and minus 2.5 right and that's i can't drive without glasses or i shouldn't but i could <laughs> but that said uh i did the program and because i got up to like four and it was like getting progressively bad i was like what the heck is going on like i had glasses in high school kind of wore them and then i started wearing them more frequently and my diopter like my eyes kept getting weaker i was like what the heck's going on uh, but his whole program is like, hey, like this is a muscle. You got to use it. You got to use your distance vision. And so the whole idea is to purchase contacts or a lens prescription for your glasses. That's a power under what your eye should be at, basically. Um, and so I did that and I went from like 4.25, 4.75 all the way down to where I'm at now. Um, I haven't seen progress since, but that's also about the time when I started uh, being in front of screens all the time. So I haven't had really a chance. And I moved from beautiful Seattle, which has mountains and all these wonderful things that you can look at to flat Ohio, which does not have beautiful things to look at. Uh, so I'm not using my distance vision as much, but I'm curious uh, what your thoughts are for that. You do have greeters ice cream though. So just that's huge. Um, I'm not we familiar do. with the program. So I, Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, we got Jenny's ice cream now, which is even better. Ooh, yeah, they really? got one in Atlanta, Columbus. They have one in Columbus. That's where they started. So when you head okay. out there, yeah, you have to check yeah, it out. I've, but anyways. Jenny's, I'll have to write that down. Yeah. Um, I'm not familiar with that program, so I, I can't comment on that either way. But um, to your point, um, again, just speaking with Dr. Landerville, uh, there's a lot of people, if they are not being evaluated by someone who looks beyond just clarity of vision, a lot of people get over prescribed. And so, you know, with someone who's got like minus eight, they're bringing everything really close so you can see. Um, but then there's a lot of things that get sacrificed on that front. So peripheral vision and things of that nature, but there's several visual skills that you can train just like anything else where you can improve the dynamics of your eyes to maybe where you need less of a prescription or in some cases none at all there's still a structural component and so that that cannot change but you can change the fu the functional component of the eyes and so um, the the sequence that she has taught me is making sure you can get peripheral vision first and then you're looking at more focal vision and then it's a matter of um, learning single-eyed visual skills like accommodation which would be like being able to throw an eye far, but then seeing it clear and then teaming the eyes together. Um, and if you can kind of work through that sequence in some way, you can make some changes. I mean, even when I looked at, I haven't done a lot of the exercises that she had prescribed to me in some time, but I was able to retain a lot of the adaptations that I had gotten uh, to where my prescription changed favorably. Yeah. So, um, and, I, and I have good vision. I just wear, my, wear stuff for the computer. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's vision is a skill just like anything else. And just like lifting weights can make you bigger muscles, practicing your visual skills can alter the way you use your eyes and the, the mechanics needed to maybe where you don't need external devices to help you to the extent that an untrained eye, see what I did there, may. I think one of the most interesting, like, cause I, when I took, did the program, I was like, this is bullshit. Like, I don't trust this at all. And he's like, if you don't believe me, like, all you got to do is like make a peephole with your hand and you look through it 
And I did that without my contacts in. And I was like, holy shit, I can see everything. <laughs> like, I could see like as far as possible. And I was like, what in the world is going on? So like, it, and it's something cool to kind of try for the listener here. Um, but that's what really kind of changed the game for me. I was like, okay, like, let me, let me get into this a little bit more. And then he has some of the ones where it's like, you know, you're getting your peripheral going, you're single eye if you want to do that. But his big thing's just like, hey, like, go outside and just use your distance vision as much as possible uh, because we're all here right now. And he's like quoting studies from, I think one of the major studies he's quoting is uh, from Japan. And it's like, they did a huge study. I, you might've seen, I can't remember the name of it, but it's like the uh, teenagers in Japan and over the course of the past, like 30 years have all since like devices have been utilized and everything in schools. Um, they've all gone from, majority of the population have a 2020 vision to like 60% of their teenage population having, you know, some form of myopia. So it's pretty crazy. Well, you use the space that you uh, work in. And so if I never have, if I never see anything beyond here, mm -hmm. the, the visual system will adapt just like anything else. Yeah. So that makes, that would make sense to me. Um, and that's, one reason why I would never want to live in New York city because yeah. it's just everything. So enclosed and right up in front of you, uh, nothing against, I mean, I, you know, I'm going there in a couple of weeks should be fun, but like, I, I like the open space. And that's one of the things that I program for a lot of my clients on their off days is uh, spend 20, 60 minutes, no headphones, go for a walk, look at everything you possibly can as far as you can and do not focus on you. Um, and I, I, there's there's legitimacy to that and yeah. one of the one of the um exercises that optometrists will have people do to take a break from screens is the 20 20 20 rule which is every 20 minutes you should look for 20 seconds out about 20 feet just so you get your eyes to relax because when you're looking at something up close your eyes converge in or they a deduct and then your uh, ciliary muscle works on works works on focusing, and so if that's on all the time and you never let that go, there's going to be adaptations to that. You can have such a thing where you converge too much, and then the inability to let the eyes relax will impact your vision. Yeah. Um, and that's like another thing too. You kind of got to be careful with some of the visual training, because like peripheral stuff, stuff where your eyes diverge or look apart, where you're looking far out, you can do a lot of that, like pretty much unlimited. But working on your ability to get the eyes looking close and converging and focusing on something like really up in front of you, that's something you can practice too much. And there's adaptations that can happen with that, which are unfavorable. What happens, I'm cu curious, like when you sleep with your vision and your eyes, like it, you close your eyes, like, I imagine there's some form of relaxation, but I know that distance vision is relaxation. So I don't know. Do you know? I don't. That's not something I've looked into as yeah. much. Um, yeah, I don't have a good answer for you. It's not something you really think about. But um, so uh, next I, I might have to because yeah, I'm, uh, I know. <laughs> I That's like what I was thinking. I was like, like there's got to be some form of relaxation, and I don't know. Eh, anyways, um, this just kind of makes me think about. Like I've had this thought in my head for a while where it's like, do we just have a job because of just modern society <laughs> at this point? Like, do, do you think that if we were just all wild humans or something that our bodies would probably be, we wouldn't see the ailments that we have at this point. You know, it, it's probably hard to speak in black and white like that, but I feel like just a lot of the issues that at least I run into with my clients, just like, you're sitting too long. You're looking at screens too much. You're chewing soft foods. You're like, there's just all these different things that seem to just compound to the point where it's just like, it's too much luxury in some ways, um, for lack of better words. But yeah, I'm just kind of, I don't know. What do you think about that? I think the problems are different. You know, um, here's one thing to think about that we, we don't worry about as much is um, how many people died in the act of childbirth we're not hunting out in the wild as much. So how many people are being killed by wild animals now compared to when we were hunter gatherers? Um, 
you know, you getting an infection in the wild or breaking a bone, that, that could be the end of you. So I think, um, I think we just have different, pro I think there's always going to be problems to solve. It's just a matter of which ones. And that you see that depending on what population you work with, the problems Kyle, that you and I are solving for our clients right now is different than the problems of someone who works in the NBA is. And, and I, I mean, having worked in that field, I know that because they're different problems. Um, and that's going to be different than if you're working in skilled nursing home. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, I think if we didn't have the luxuries that we do now, we'd probably, like if, if PT was still a thing, God, could you imagine me treating in a loincloth? But um, if PT was still a thing, Fred Flintstone style. It would probably be a lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, uh, yeah, the, the exclusive Zach Couples content. <laughs> I know ZachCouples.com. <laughs> Link in the description below, yeah. Um, but I, I, my suspicion would be you'd, you'd deal with a lot more acute injuries and accidents and things of that nature because when you're more active, those are the things that would likely become more problematic. But maybe some of the more chronic, I don't even know. Like, would you live that so a lot of the issues life? that we have too, is because we just live longer. Yeah. You know, like in certain eras of human existence, like man, thirties was old. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a lot of diseases of aging that happen. And while we can slow them down, eventually like you're going to succumb to something just because of the repeat cell division over time. So, um, yeah, it's a good question, though. I, I don't know what would be different, but I still think there would be issues. Well, there definitely were old people back then, for sure. I know I'm a big YouTube history buff, and there was a recent site of like Neanderthals and Denisovans, which are a new homo species, basically, that came about. Um, huh. And yeah, super interesting stuff. Um, I can send you some, I go way down these rabbit holes, but that said, uh, one of the Denise events, I believe, or maybe it was a Neanderthal uh, that they found had no teeth and had no teeth for a long, like a really long period of time to the point where this person became very old. And, you know, this is back, like, they're using stone tools at this point, like barely using stone tools. And so someone was having to probably like chew their food up for them or smash it down or, and like feed them as an elder. So like this stuff was, and it was really interesting. Like the commentary uh, from the archeologists was like, you know, this is the kind of stuff that makes us human. Like, you know, this is cohabitating mm -hmm. and caring and loving for someone else. And like, to the point where you're literally probably like free chewing your, their food for them. Um, so, you know, there were old people back then for sure. I'm going to have to start recommending that as a treatment before someone decides to get a splint or uh, get a maxillary skeletal expander. If you haven't done that, then you're not ready. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> or just be that's like, hey, it's, no, it's, that's just something that's always kind of been on my mind with that stuff. Is It's just like, man, are we just like over like just in so much luxury and all that? But like you said, you said it before, like you're, you're always going to have a bag of crap to deal with. And it's just like, pick and choose what it is and move on with it. So just how you solve it and how you handle that stuff. But, um, so just kind of like, you know, summarizing this a little bit, um, what are some, I guess, what are some things outside of physical therapy or training that you're looking into? Like what has been, what's Zach been up to besides that? I know you've been hiking a little bit, but like, are there other resources that you've been like, just kind of checking out and enjoying? And from like a learning standpoint or a fun standpoint? Both, man. Both. Okay. Well, fun. Um, I, I do hike, but I also am an avid escape room junkie and I like VR. And uh, those have kind of been like big things that I've uh, really been into. Um, I think I've done almost 60 or 70 escape rooms since 2018. That was the first time I did one. Yeah. Did you there was like a period a of time for that. Like, <laughs> Uh, I keep my win loss record and yeah, so we did one this, uh, I did a staycation with my girlfriend and, um, we did one this past weekend and we got the dub. Bam. So I felt good about that. It's just fun though, because like, it's, it kind of caters to my, like some of the fantasy kid stuff. I used to play video games way back when, but it, it's like you're present focus on one specific task and you can kind of just focus only on that. And there's the suspension of belief, which is kind of fun. Um, and it's the same thing with virtual reality. Like that's 
a lot of fun as well. It's got to be um, like good bonding and like it's objective based and yeah, you get that dopamine hit. Like, <laughs> well, yeah, and so normally I hate doing escape rooms with people I don't know because mm. I mean you really have to like delegate roles and you know know what you're good at and know what this person's good at and like hey try this puzzle because I suck at this and we ended up doing one that had people who we didn't know and so it's kind of like figuring out what people are good at and like there were some people in the group that just freaking rocked it and uh but it was a matter of like i remember there was one i had to like get this key out of a bottle and i just wasn't getting it and the woman's like well you gotta do this this and it's like you know you go do that i'm gonna go find something that i'm good at um and so th like that it's just it's cool to kind of figure that out like really read the other person in a, in a less than an hour because you only got an hour to escape the room um so that's been fun i, I i've been doing that a lot and uh I go out to eat a lot, which is a lot of fun too, especially living in Vegas. It's one of the nice things. Um, so I got, got a lot of those planned this upcoming weekend. Um, and then learning wise, um, a lot of it has been what I do now, because like early in my career, I just took everything course wise, which I think is good when you know nothing. And not that I still know anything, but um, now the way I tackle problems is I have the specific problem. And I find the person who has solved that problem and I pay them for their time and I learn that way. And that's been really helpful um, when it comes to physical therapy, training, things of that nature. So like this past year, I've worked with Tony Holler, who's a track coach. He's brilliant because um, I had a sprinter who I'm just we were kind of collaborating with. Um, and that was really good experience working with my optometrist um, like that. Those have been quite helpful. Um, but the thing I'm kind of basically spending the large survey process with now is is business because um, I, I think when when you develop the skill set to the extent that I have not saying I'm the man but it's like there's just there, there's some there's there's some complex problems that I have to solve and you can't you know when you're working with really complex cases it's not something that you're not going to see five of these in an hour and expect to get a good outcome so I've had to really condense the number of people that I see, but that doesn't help me make a large impact. So I have to find ways to scale what I can do. And so that's educating other people. That's finding ways to build the business, which is where I'm kind of pointing this to, to where I can find a way to make a, uh, the largest impact possible um, without me being the rate limiting step. And so that's, you know, I got Chris Collette, who's a guy who trains with me, um, and he trains uh, several clients, and he's doing amazing things. Um, but I have to find ways to teach him. I have to find ways to get him the skill set. I have to find ways to market so he can get people. And um, it's finding those business skills that I never really took the time to learn until I've had my own business. And so a lot of my learning is finding ways of best doing that and then finding just better ways to teach because that's another form of scale you know i again in a day i might be able to help four to six people because that's about what i see when i'm working with clients but if i can teach 25 people at a seminar how to do what i do well now i've just 25 x that and there's just no way that I, I have not, I've yet to find a better way that I could scale some of this stuff or if I can make a really good video and get really good at my coaching and trying to make it as simple as possible. So a person who maybe can't afford my services or any services for that matter. And like, this is all that they have. If I can make it good enough that they can get an improvement and I can get the video to have a million eyeballs, like, wow, maybe I've helped 20,000 people. And it's just like that, that's something I had never thought about when getting into physical therapy, but it's just finding as many different ways as possible that you can help people and then solving the problems needed to better carry out that process. What do you think is the biggest challenge? Like, cause I, I totally understand where you're coming from and that's been something like I have a very similar outlook, right? It's like, you know, once you get past, the hurdle of like, well, let me post, let me talk about my experiences, all that stuff. And then starts to become like, well, how can I make this better? And, you know, 
what would you say is like the biggest challenge between like free content and videos that you're putting out there? Like, are you trying to hammer one point or are you trying to make it just very well thought out? Um, and then, you know, maybe we can talk about like something that is paid for, like someone coming to you and like doing that stuff. Like, how does that, there, there's different challenges. Maybe that's too broad. Maybe let's just start with the free stuff. Like, how do you, how are you hitting that so well? It's making it, it really comes back to a lot of the stuff that I teach in the seminar is, you know, I'll, I'll make five different videos where I use the same exercises because those videos target similar things. Mm -hmm. But I have to frame the way it's targeting that thing to a specific problem. So like, you know, I could have a hip, something about hip pain and something about shoulder pain and they have the same exercise in them. But I have to meet that person where they're at, use the language that they're familiar with, and then bring them closer to where I think they need to be. And when you're talking about free content, you can't give them an exercise that has 12 different cues. And I made that mistake in, in videos. Um, and, and so I continue to try to refine that process of making things simpler. And um, even then, like I have people who say, Zach, I tried this in your video and I think I'm doing it right. And they're not. Um, so it's just like, that's an impetus on me to like, I need to make it even better. Um, and I, in terms of like free versus paid, uh, Alex Hormozzi, who's uh, I'm a big fan of, he's a very popular um, business right YouTuber. Here. He's run a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to get the leads, man. It's coming out. Get soon. the leads. Oh, leads. oh I'm, that's next on the list. So yeah, um, but he he says um, give away all the knowledge you can for free, like to the point where it hurts, and then pay for the implementation. And that's to me that's made the most sense to me in terms of how you can provide value to people. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that's basically what I do is like, look, I'm going to, I'll tell, tell you everything. <laughs> like there's, there's not going to be any secrets, um, that I'm going to have from like a knowledge standpoint that I would withhold because you could probably find it if you read enough books or you consume enough research or you screw around in the clinic or in the gym long enough. But where I try to help people and where it now becomes a paid thing is well, let me teach you how to do it. Or for Chris, Chris is going to coach you how to do it. Or, Hey, I'm going to teach you how to do this with your clients on a consistent basis. Um, and it's just the odds of a person succeeding in that domain are higher than if they're just trying to figure it out on their own for free. But again, I, in order for me to be able to do that, there has to be an income piece there. To, otherwise I, I can't, you know, I'll be out on the street and then I won't have a sure SM seven B mic to talk to through or in a loincloth <laughs> exactly yeah you do not want me doing street pt in a loincloth no tarzan one zach to... like running around the streets of vegas <laughs> I, I gotta work on my hair though man that's gonna be the limiter hey man not, you don't have to do the <laughs> not in vegas you just do what you want <laughs> <laughs> that's right no that's right that's uh no that's a good point like i think the the big takeaway i got from that is just practice and that's something i've noticed too like you know i've made the same video about it or I've talked about the same topic multiple multiple times and each time I talk about it you know I get feedback I use it on someone else in a different scenario I like I figure something else about it I use a different analogy that made more sense to this person and I use that in a video like it just you have to just sit in it almost to really make this stuff start to to hammer out and you know I've been a long time follower of yours and it's it's awesome to watch, you know, your the evolution of your YouTube channel and all this stuff and how where you started to where you are now and you got the studio and all that. Like it just, but it, again, you're a testament to it takes time. And if you want to make this happen, you have to practice, basically. <laughs> you just have to do it. There's yeah, no way around it, it's that. like anything else. You can't, you can't get rich quick. You can't uh, build muscle in a week. You can't turn around your health in three months if you're in a big deficit. So any anything that's worthwhile in life takes time. You can't have a successful marriage in one year. It has to be um, following processes that are going to push you to whatever your goal is and then 
solving for whatever the, the rate limiting step is along the way that's preventing you from getting to the next level of things. And um, the better you get at that, the further you can get along in whatever game you want to play. You know, whether it's producing content, whether it's being good at your job, whether it's being good at your marriage, anything. It's all the same process. Totally. No, and it's discipline and just committing to it at the end of the day. But so speaking of the next thing, what's the next thing for Zach? What's Zach doing next? What are you, what's your big goals? My big goals, man, that's a great question. Um, you know, uh, there's a book called how to fail at almost anything and still win big by Scott Adams. Um, who's the, the Dilbert creator. Uh, it's a good book. Um, and he is very anti-goal and more about like, just having really good processes in place. And then ideally those processes will help push you to whatever it is, the things that you want to do. And so I guess my goal would be refining processes right now to help continue to scale my ability to help people. So, you know, that's continuing to refine my seminar. Um, that's teaching other people to, help carry out some of the things that I do with patients and clients. Um, I'm, I'm hoping to bring on some more people to work through some of the remote stuff that I'm doing right now so I can just better scale things. And, and so that's, those are kind of the, the next iterations of where I'm heading next. And then just continue to refine my skill set. Um, you know, I, there's, there's a lot I still need to learn just like the vestibular stuff and, and some of the visual stuff that I was talking about. So I think from like a professional side, that's, that's where I'm headed uh, with that. And then um, we'll see what happens from there. That's very opposite of where I've been. I've been like 10, five, one goal planning, you know, setting this big, but I think you're probably at this point too, where you you're in, you have probably like a 10 year idea of where you want to be at. And then it's just like the processes. So like this past year, it's like, I've already made the goals. It's just, doing it and executing so now like basically my goal this year was just double everything and make it more efficient from what i did last year because i did good stuff <laughs> just double down on what works basically so yeah yeah well and i think too if being being overly goal focused makes you not enjoy the process along the way because once you hit the goal it's like then what um, See, I'm the opposite. So I, <laughs> yeah, you're like, oh yeah, that's awesome. I'm like, cross um, that off the list with a big sharpie. Like, I love that. <laughs> like, yeah, well, and so, to be fair, um, I, I mean, I know I got like the gray background right now, but my whiteboards are there, and like, when anytime I wipe something off, it's like, oh yeah, that feels good. So I, I understand that. There's that completionist thing. Um, I do think there's. Maybe this is a goal. Maybe it's, I'm just arguing semantics at this point, but just continuing to refine processes that bring good things, I think is um, really impactful and just continuing to analyze that and, and change that. Um, and that's just kind of, I think what's worked for me, but some people do really well with goals and I've, I've used goal setting in the past, you know, when it, when it came to like uh, um, eradicating my student loans, like, which that was a monumental thing. Um, and I like, just spent like two to three years just grinding to make that happen. It was like, okay, first goal, get this small loan. Next goal, get the next one, get the next one, get the next one until I hit it. And that's like, ah, that feels great. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, whatever strategy you need to use to get the outcomes that you want out of life, just keep doing that. Totally. No, I completely agree. Well, Zach, I appreciate you coming on this call, man. Uh, don't want to be respectful of your time and everything. Uh, I know you got some calls coming up. Uh, that said, uh, you mind hitting us with some show notes? Tell us where we can find you, all that good stuff. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you for having me, Kyle. It's, uh, it was great catching up, man. I love the conversation. We hit some cool stuff. Uh, ZachCouples.com, Z-A-C-C-U-P-P-L-E-S.com is the website that's pretty much got um, blogs, links to my YouTube, which is you can find me on Zach Couples uh, if you search Zach Couples. Uh, it's got links to my services, my seminar, Human Matrix. We got uh, quite a few of those uh, across the U.S. and Canada in 2023. So definitely check us out. 
Um, and then I'm on all social medias. I'm on, I'd say YouTube's probably my biggest at this point. So you search Zach Couples, um, Instagram, Zach, Z-A-C, Couples, C-U-P-P-L-E-S is my second biggest. And then uh, I have Twitter, Threads. You search my name. I got TikTok, got it all. So if you search my name, Zach Couples, you'll find me. Perfect. Well, thanks again, Zach. And we will see you guys in the next one.